first, and then we'll get into question and discussion. Okay, hello, I'm Stuart Garvey. Um, I'm now the president of Bell Media Sales. We run um, advertising across TV, out of home radio, and digital in Canada. I'm Brian Colbert. I'm the general manager of emerging technologies for iPunWeb, and we build media trading solutions. Uh, in this space, we built a supply platform for Dish. I'm Michael Bologna. I'm with Modi Media, and we are an addressable television uh, agency within the United States. Good morning. Uh, my name is Laurent Smile. Uh, I recently joined Liberty Global to spearhead the innovation in advanced advertising, and my background is in data with TV audience measurement, TV beat, um, and broadcasting with MTG for 11 years. Good morning. My name is uh, Xavier Denis. I'm with Aris. Uh, we specialize on uh, targeted ad delivery solutions for uh, service providers. Great. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna start with Mike from the buyer and agency and advertiser perspective, and then I'm gonna work through to the media side with Stu, and then what's that? <laughs> we, 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 we. So so Mike, you've been doing this probably longer than anybody out there. And um, you've worked with, with basically everybody in the U.S. ecosystem. And I, you've been doing these conferences probably more than anybody, too. And now that kind of everybody's starting to do addressable, technology is getting deployed. We're seeing scale in the U.S. market. Where Sky is doing what they've been doing in the U.K. market. And we have other countries as well. I wanted to get kind of a state of the union. And you know, what were the real hard parts? And then kind of what is next? Because everybody seems to be getting to basic addressable parity and understands what the words mean. So what's next? Yeah, so <clears throat> it's interesting. The, the, what people think are the hard part is actually the easy part. And what people assume is the easiest path is actually the reverse. Technology is not the problem. It never has been and never <clears throat> will be. The technology to deploy addressable advertising is there. It's there in spades. The challenge is the business model the economics, and truthfully, the process. I mean, in order to pull off a stunt, like sending a commercial only to households that have purchased a particular brand of toothpaste in the past six weeks, and then reply back to the advertiser that they spent X amount of dollars on sending commercials to those households that have purchased toothpaste, and that those households then converted to an actual customer of that brand of toothpaste, that's hard. That requires not only technology, but it requires data. It requires privacy compliance. And it requires, at least in the United States, multiple mutual parties working together. That's the hard, that's the hard part. I mean, we started this in, 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 in 2006. That was the very first addressable campaign that, that I put together in 2006. It was targeting households that were non-AT&T customers. And, and, and now, in, in, in 16, literally 10 years later, we've spent over $300 million. We have over 150 clients using this, and 85% of those clients have been return clients. So there's, there, there's really three things that, that make sense. Addressability comes down to three things. If you get the target right, okay, if you're much, any more than 35% of the population of whichever market you're in, addressability doesn't make sense. You might as well buy the entire pie and eat the waste, right? If you just want the slices, you need to be under 35%. You gotta get the price right. Like, simple calculator, do the math. Women 25 to 54, everyone. Women with children under 12 that purchase soup. How does it work out, right? If you get the price right for just the people that purchase the soup, then you're and then you're sold. And the third piece is probably the most important piece, measurement. Too many people, too many advertisers, I should say, use addressability to check off a box. A brand manager wants to use addressability to impress his or her CMO. Not the right decision. If you get the measurement right, so when I give you that 85% figure, that's when I get the measurement right. If I can go to the advertiser and tell them at the end of the campaign, here's how much money you spent, and here's what was your return on ad spend. Here's what was your, how many customers, sales you actually got. They will come back. So get the target right, which is the size. Get the price right. Handle the measurement prior to implementation. You're sold. And every advertiser will come back. 
So one follow-on, and I'm going to jump this too. Let me. I would have one question in Europe. And no offense, but we're not in the U.S. here. Um, the people who have the ability to <laughs> addressability are the telcos, the cable operators, the satellite owners, but the people selling addressability are the broadcasters. So at Liberty, we have um, decided that we want to be an enabler, and the partnership with broadcaster is something we want to really be totally agnostic to. Uh, we want to bring broadcasters on the journey. I totally agree. It's, it's very hard. It's, you know, the demand is still very new in Europe. Um, the processes are very complicated. Um, people don't know if they're buying GRPs or impressions. But as a telco operator, we really want to get the broadcasters on that journey and be an enabler of addressability. Yep. That journey will take 2,000 years. <laughs> so, Stu, so you're... <laughs> That's a lot of conferences for Justin, by the way. <laughs> so Stu, um, so you're, you're a vertically integrated company, right? You have a cable, a cable business and a media business, and you also have... Well, let's put that in the right way. Our cable and telco business has a media business. Yes, that's right. And then you also have a, 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 a diverse set of big media businesses, TV, radio, and digital. How are you thinking about these capabilities as related to your whole portfolio of offerings? Well, I think there's lots of it was said earlier, you know, and it's out of home too, so we have a sizable out of home business. So when I think about cross-platform, I'm not thinking about digital, I'm thinking about all sorts of screens and audio and digital. So it's, um, it, it's a real challenge to try and get the data across all of our offering to make it easier for our customers to use all of our offering in the right way. And I think one of the really interesting things that was said earlier, we talk about addressability, and again, with respect, we, we would all love to have two minutes of free airtime <coughs> to, to put addressable stuff into, but we don't. So I think this addressability thing, certainly in Canada where the majority of television is bought on broad audiences, is a continuum of, of data targeting that goes all the way to one-to-one -one addressability to a household. You know, right now we're buying 85% in Canada against 1854s and 2554s. It would be about 200% better if we, get, we had some data-enabled audiences to buy our television better. And we could then start to prove it works better. So I think it's, it's a continuum for us. We're, we're starting, again, along a sort of baby steps journey. We're working with you guys on some VOD um, insertion. I think we're going to talk about size of market because if you talk about VOD, it's so small now that if you made it addressable, again, to your point, you're not really getting a sizable audience. So there are all those challenges. About this, right? I mean, clearly, <coughs> the US, we're the dumbest market in the world, right? <laughs> we're not that bright. Everyone here is smarter than we are. What, what's, ta what's taking, so Canada, what's taking Rogers, Shaw? I mean, we have Coach Co., which is which has produced some addressable results, but what's taking so long? What do you think the actual. Well, I, I, I fundamentally disagree with <coughs> you that it isn't a technology problem because we all have different boxes. So, and Keith's very aware of this because he's working with us all and he's tearing his hair out. But we all have different boxes. And we to get, too, though. But to get, if, if, say if we just did addressable on Al Darks in the room, on Roger's boxes, you'd be addressable in Ontario. So automatically, you're fairly addressable anyway because you're one province. We've got a huge market that's very diverse and different versions of companies across different footprints. So we have to get to a point where we're working with people like Keith to get to a unified platform so we can offer addressability at a certain scale, otherwise it's not sort of worth the investment. Therein lies the thousand year journey. No, I, I couldn't agree more, but you've got, you've got three vertically integrated companies who at the top level are hugely competitive. So three media people at the bottom end trying to work together is, is relatively difficult and challenging. It is, but look at, look at what we went through, and I understand again to your point, we're not in the US, but we have 12 different cable systems, five dis different addressable technology providers, 50 different data systems, and it's a total mess. But we you, got through it. You, so I, th I think the big difference is, I mean, at least having sold in the US and Canada, is it's because that two, minute, two minutes existed. So in the US, the, the TV platform providers get two minutes of inventory, right? They're the ones that pay us or NVIDI or, or a visible world to deploy these capabilities. And the, the ROI comes from the, the two minutes. 
And I think, like with you, there are, liberty, there, are, there is no two minutes. But that's good. The two minutes is a blessing and a curse. So what Mike Walsh just said, he's 100% spot on. Right now, <clears throat> the two minutes is enough inventory right. to supply the demand. But that will run out. Yep. When that runs out, then we'll be in the same problem as the rest of the world, and we'll have to somehow figure out a way for national inventory to become addressable. And that's when you'll see the U.S., drop behind yeah, every I, other global market. So we are ahead right now. Fast forward five, six I, years, we will be completely I, behind. I totally agree. There's I think, not a single thing we can do about I it. I think, I mean, we spent a lot of time on this, Lawrence. I think it's a, it's a hard problem to figure out how your business model works because you have these assets, which is a managed network. You have persistent IDs to target against, and you can enable very high quality transparent matching against that, and you can do it with a measurement. It's a huge value add. The question is, what, what do you get in return for that from your content providers? Because at the end of the day, they, you know, for the most part, they don't pay, pay, that, pay for those technology costs. You, you, Liberty has to. Yeah, so for us, addressability is really about keeping money in the advertising ecosystem. Um, the death of ad-funded TV is a death for telco as well, because we would have to pass the increased pricing and content procurement into the subscribers. That's not what we want to do. So we absolutely want to keep the money within the ecosystem. Um, we need a scale. I think you, you benefited from having a larger scale. We're still very fragmented. You know, the largest operator in Europe, up Sky, with you know, 7 million addressable boxes. Um, and the demand wasn't there either. Um, the demand is starting to come up as people are really realizing that Facebook and Google are moving into the video ad space, starting to take away some advertising monies. Um, TV needs to reinvent himself, um, and we are there to support a new ad fund. And now, I believe that it's not going to be three years or five years until addressable takes takes a lot of money from TV. I really believe they're still gonna be the top of the funnel and they're still gonna be brand advertising to the mass and we don't wanna change that. What we wanna do is bring back some of the digital monies back into TV. And we have a couple of examples. So um, we've just launched addressables. I think we're the second market after Sky to launch addressables. It's still a test market. It's in Belgium. Um, the team has put an immense effort to bring the technology together. And now that we start excelling, we're seeing that Advertisers want this uh, either because they couldn't afford TV before, so they want to do either targeting or um, a smaller audiences that they can finally afford. Uh, also for referencing perspective, so we've seen brands who are demanded by the retailer, the Tesco's of the world, to place some money on digital. Well, now they can come to TV on a digital pricing uh, for smaller audiences to keep the referencing. Uh, we also see brands coming and say that they, they want to test addressable because they want access to the data. Um, we've had an amazing example yesterday. Some of you were in the room where um, a Sky and Argos uh, example of how to use data to better manage campaign with a higher return and an RI, which is sales, um, and Argos publicly said that they had 7 million uplift in sales through using data from, from, from Sky uh, panel. So um, you, that's how we, we bring the demand through. Would you, you just hit the most important point in any addressable discussion, right? And it's important that we, hit, uh, that we reinforce it. Addressability will never be 100% of every advertiser's budget. It will probably never be 50%. If we fast forward 15 years when we're 100% addressable in any global market, it'll simply be used for exactly what you just said. It'll feed the funnel. You're always gonna need mass awareness and you're always gonna need hyper-targeting. And addressable technology will simply be used to manage the frequency between the message to all, the message to one, and everything in between. And that's consistent across anywhere in the world. Right, but I, I think that the problem, the challenge and the opportunity is that, um, I think the challenge is a lot of people are building for what happens right now. And what's going to happen in some point in time is that the market, and it's already happening in certain ways basically, it used to be that TV was the way to reach everybody. That's no longer happening. And that is going, my opinion is it's gonna fall off a cliff in five years, right? Because you have consumer behaviors that change and there's nothing anybody can do about it on the kind of the existing front. So build for what's coming. And building for what's coming means that you have some way of representing not just the addressable inventory, but you have the linear inventory, you have the OTT inventory that's owned by the broadcasters, and you work collectively in a way that not just maintains privacy, 
but maintains the value of the data because what the operators have is they have data, right? And linear plus data is actually really useful. And you look at performance, TV buyers now do an amazing job on getting their message across very dumb technology platforms. And it isn't about the technology, it's about measuring the outcome. And as soon as you make it possible to measure outcomes across awareness, across consideration, across whatever journey you want, in a way that the buyers can do easily, then that'll happen. But I think that, that, I mean, Modi does a great job, but I think that they're relatively unique in that most buyers are very siloed, they operate very independently, they can't measure across different campaigns. They're stupid. Right, and so, so they're not gonna change that because they make a lot of money doing that. Right. So, but supply doesn't know the value of their inventory unless they apply the data, and you have to bring the data, you bring the inventory together, and then you can package it in a way. Doesn't mean not business models aren't gonna change, but that's what Google and Facebook do. What Google and Facebook do, if you look at what Google did with Google TV years ago in the US. Failed. Nah, but yes and no, they failed for business reasons, right? But what they did, and if you, if you kind of go through the process, what they did is they said, look, we're gonna, we're gonna provide the operators a lot of data. The operators had no idea what to do with that. Then Google basically acted as someone who was a market maker. They figured out the balance between supply and demand, and I think most operators now don't know the true value of their inventory across channels, across things, to your point. That data does not operate seamlessly, and that's a lot of work. But if you know the value of your inventory, now you can make intelligent decisions about it. Until you know what you have, good luck. Right, and I think very few operators why, why know. We, why do we always go to the end transaction of actually dynamically inserting the ad? Oh, but it has nothing because, to do because, with it. because it's a continuum, right? So you can yeah. get fairly addressable by adding and loaded granular data. I pretty, I pretty much know what's gonna be on air at 10.15 and like next Monday night on CTV. That's coming, and, and if I add data to that, and I can decision on it eight weeks before, it, it's, again, it's, we, we sort of get to, a, we, we jump to the transaction and how do we get the technology to dynamically insert on our streams, and we're not gonna go dark. Right. You can't plan against it or, or manage your yield against it. Exactly. Against the so so I, data. I, I guess I'm violently agreeing with you, but yeah. it's, <laughs> it shouldn't just be about the transaction and, at the end. It's, it's about how do we add more data, get better audience composition for what is required for each individual campaign. So that's, that's I agree with that 100%. I mean, the, right. the, I do. <laughs> and if to be very honest, in the US, four times, four times as much money is being spent against what we call indexing, and that's instead of dynamically inserting the ad to the household to purchase soup, it's buying the inventory that we know indexes well against the households to purchase soup. So that, that is very, that's, and, that, and, that's, and that's going to continue on that trajectory. The problem with the silos and the buyers, yes, TV buyers, not the brightest in the world. But you also look at the advertisers. When you look at the advertisers and you ask them who they want to reach, do you know how many of them look you straight in the eye and say, I want to reach adults 18 to 49? I want to slap them. Slap them twice. Because they literally cannot come up with a target. They don't know right. who they want to reach. And they won't be ready for, never mind dynamic ad insertion, they're not even ready for that level of data-infused television do, do if the they market, don't know what they want to reach. The market is not ready either. I mean, we have an internal campaign. You know, as a as a platform, we also spend a lot of money on TV, by the way. And we have tested, it, again, in Telenet with one, of our, with one of our product, how we could potentially optimize our planning. We went to the agency and said, we want to target this kind of group, buy this place, in this location, that do this and this and this. And they said, can you just buy all 1859? So we have, again, to take on board. You think um, they're right? Well, no, because we actually ended up convincing them and we had a compromise and again, great, great work from the Telenet team in uh, having the agency taking the risk with us and say, well, we will try, we will address, well, we will plan based on the Telenet data for slightly less than 50% of the, of the campaign and traditionally for the over 50. And it resulted um, in the ability for Telenet to spend a second wave of advertising because they had a uh, great uh, great results. So again, I think the agencies also need to evolve in the ability to use data in their planning in a way that hasn't been done before. So that is a thousand percent true, right? Agencies, we're a big part, we're, we are a big part of the problem. Like we are a huge part of the problem. We grew up and we were trained 
to buy against broad segments by that big Nielsen scam that we have in the US, right? You ask 100 million people, 20,000 people what they watch, and we assume the other 100 million watch the same, right? That's the way we were trained, and that's the way advertisers are trained to think. So to go from the shift to a dynamic ad insertion, to a data infuse, whatever, everything that everyone else here on the panel is saying, that's a big challenge for us. Like We were not taught that. So a big part of the problem in getting to addressability, regardless of the global market, is us. It's agencies thinking about the planning process and saying, how can I reduce my waste by refining my targets without going too far off the, off the grid that the advertiser gets scared and runs in the other direction? And that's a very, very difficult balance, but we're, 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 we're a huge part of the problem. And I wish it weren't the case, but we are. Don't you think it's a, a lack of communication of goals, to your point? Like, I think it's... Okay, brand, you want to reach brand. What does that mean? Somebody's doing a survey, somebody's measuring store visits, some you know, return, like, that data is there. Like, there is data that reflects the brand awareness. And sure, everybody knows who, who Coke or Pepsi is, but in the US, Pepsi is bought a company that makes kombucha, right? So, right, who are the people, that's not the same people who buy normal Pepsi, right? So, just because you know it's Pepsi and not everybody knows that Pepsi owns that company and Coke has their water, I mean, like, Everybody has a very diverse thing, mm -hmm. so you have, to, you have to have specific goals in mind. And if you just want to waste your money and throw it at things and hope that everybody buys your stuff because it's there, that, doesn't, that only works for so long. And I think it's the, the, the thing that, that gets overlooked in all of this, um, and not, not to draw too broad of an analogy, but if you look at kind of election results in certain countries, like people have all of these panels and surveys telling them one thing that are completely wrong. They're asking the wrong question. Right, so we keep we keep repeating and kind of feeding this loop into our own system. We got Donald Trump. Right. How long can we be? <laughs> right. Well, and Brexit wasn't even close. Like people, what they actually think and what they actually believe and what actually motivates them, they're not going to tell you on a survey. You have to look at what actually happens in the real world when someone does something. So, so I go back to that. That is measurement information that is owned by the, the advertiser. The, well, well, no, it's really owned by the TV platform provider, right? Because they're the ones that know who is watching what based on devices I was going to go to use. I mean, I, I will tell you, even I, having worked with, with Virgin Media, even pre-Liberty, one of the things I, I see, Laurence, is your other kind of, the other players in the global TV provider space, they don't have data teams and advertising teams like Liberty Global does, right? And I think, like, do you see, what are you seeing across your customer base and that you're working with uh, the TV platform providers? Well, I think it's interesting what, what you're hearing because uh, in the U.S., I think the perspective I get also is that, you know, there is perhaps also a, a tendency to refrain from experimentation, right? There is a lot of money that's being made today, both on the, you know, on the national inventory, on the, on the two minutes. And the question is, how do you, you know, from, from the seller perspective, how do you uh, convince yourself that addressability is, gonna, is not going to, uh, cannibalize your revenue or actually decrease it worse. Um, I, I think that, you know, uh, there's still some work to do there. And yeah, the, the data side of things, I think there's a ton of data. The question is, you know, how to harness it uh, and how also to, to harmonize it across, across platforms or across M MVPDs, to right. be frank, yeah. as well, right? Because, so again, you, that's, that's where scale comes into play. But what you said makes, makes sense. So part of the holdback of all this stuff isn't technology, isn't data, it's simply people's greed. I don't want to go here if it's going to affect here. I don't want to cannibalize my existing business. The U.S. is a perfect other, other, example. Other markets don't have that problem. We don't have, have that problem. problem. But Sorry. the U.S., it's a huge problem. It's the same way. I was, I was speaking to a bunch of Spanish and French agency guys. They don't want digital. That's work. It's a lot of work. Right? I mean, who wants to do, who wants to work? And who gets paid for that right? work? They get paid very nicely. They have a good time. They have good conversations with the advertisers and the broadcasters, and everybody's happy. Who wants to change that? Mm -hmm. The broadcasters also have the same scam going for years, right? The ratings go down, they raise the, they raise the prices, and everybody stands in line with a checkbook. What a bunch of idiots, right? So it's not, if everyone stands in line to write a check for less viewers and more money, like, Right, and, yeah, and that's, that's the opportunity that you know, the digital platforms have, and it could be Snapchat next year or anybody else. They automate this, right? You can't, people do a good job at it now, but this is not a problem that's solved by throwing more people at the problem. This is about understanding the data, understanding the motivations, and actually experimenting and iterating think you're right. at a fast base, basis, whether it's the agency side, whether it's the broadcasters. I think that the supply side is actually better 
because they have to understand, right? So if you're a broadcaster, you have, let's just say you have linear, but you have over the air, right? You make your content available as a broadcaster. You now start having data. They have to kind of consolidate that up. You're forced to, you don't have a choice. The market's changing, your consumers are going different places. I think it's much more on the demand side, right? It's too much work, and it affects the agency model, it affects the way they get funded, it, certain, it affects everybody's funded. business model. We don't get paid anymore. Well, somehow you get paid, somehow you get paid. Mm, but anyway, much. But, I, but in a general sense, right? It, it affects people's business models, right? And it's not even individual, like fundamentally it changes things, and do you adapt? So if we dropped everyone's business model and everyone's you know, request for all their money, and we just focused the energy purely on making whatever level of television enhancement is necessary, whether it be data infused, whether it be dynamic ad insertion, or whatever it might be, it would happen. But what you said is 100% right. Everyone's business model is infected, is, is, is well, you know, impacted by it, and that's the problem. Hold on a second, there's quite a lot of broadcasters in this room who will probably agree with me when I say, if we get more targeted, the CPMs go up and we make more money. Uh, yeah. Jacob said it quite clearly earlier on. He's the head of digital at Group M. There's a, there's a guy from, from Chorus here in Canada, Canada who's got an RPD product. That's the only one that's growing. It's a data product and it's growing for him. So we all see the, the upside of it. I don't think anyone's scared of the business model. It's all the other things we're talking about. It's how do we, how do we get that data and, and manipulate it properly so it works with good insight and we get on that continuum properly. It's not, it's not a business model case, because every time you go more targeted, I'm going to charge you a higher CPM. It's just the way it works. So I, I don't think it's a business model thing. And, and it's sometimes certainly, it's, certainly not it's green. worth it, and sometimes it's not. Well, correct. Sometimes that CPM is not worth it. Correct. But that's a, that's a business decision. I don't think it's a business model holding anything back in terms of addressability. I think we're all working very hard to be as data-driven as we can possibly be for our clients. And so I, I'm, I'm not sure that's the right case, that it's business models holding people back. Let me ask a question uh, about uh, privacy, right? Because you, you have to look, Laurence, across a, a, a bunch of different countries in terms of your purview. It, do, you, do you see privacy opt-in policies as big blockers for, for building out addressable capabilities, or do you think they're manageable for the most part? I think it's more of a customer experience. Um, as a telco, we always had a relationship to the customer. Um, um, we've been gathering data for a while. Um, the regulation have embraced that. Now they're changing. They're going to be more ask, asking for the customer to be aware. But it's our role to make it a great customer experience. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure a customer would not want to have relevant data. I mean, if you don't have kids, why do you want to see Pampers ad all the time? But if you do have a kid, maybe you want to see a Pampers ad. Um, so if it's more relevant, more contextual, maybe less ad load, but at a higher price so that we don't damage the, the underlying business model. Um, and if the customer experience is great, then um, I don't see why the customer wouldn't consent to giving its data away. And, and they will pay that higher CPM. I mean, it, we look at CPMs and addressable television, they're as high as $500 per thousand. And it's, the advertiser will take it all the way to the bank. Like if you do the math right, if you get the target right, those CPMs that you're suggesting are well worth it. So Mike, let me ask you, on the earlier panel, the, uh, the person from Santander, like it, uh, you, you've run so many of these campaigns. Are the creatives, are they taking advantage of the no. addressable capabilities and messaging in a way to a narrow audience? Not even or close. No? Yeah. The, the, basically, the creative was designed for a target. It gets used for that target and everyone else in mass TV. So addressability is simply used as a means to increase the frequency to the core target right. audience that that creative was designed for. It doesn't make it right, but it, at least in the US, we still have that problem that it costs so much to create a piece of creative that the scale of addressability does not warrant the production of multiple versions. I hope that changes, and that's where I believe literally in a couple of years, the US will be much further behind the rest of the world because um, these things, these things don't exist. Stu, are you guys, for, uh, from a media standpoint, are you working? Are are you having discussions with your clients about evolving the creative development process in terms of being able to speak to more narrower audiences? Yes, it's one of the things we offer. We have loads of production, so we offer it. But it's, um, go, I mean, we look with absolute envy at the U.S. and the data they can use. We just can't use it in Canada. 
I mean, you can get down to people's medical IDs. <laughs> you can elect a Trump. <laughs> you can elect a Trump. <laughs> so I think, I think the privacy one is a, is a very valid point in lots of markets, Canada being one, that you know, we're very sensitive to people's data. It's a bit like France. So we have to work around that very hard. And you know, there's, a, there's a government working group on how we get set-top box data together for a measurement system. That's going to take, to your point, a thousand years as well, because everyone's sitting there trying to work out from their own we call them BDUs, MVBDs, how they share that data, and even in a, just a measurement system across the country, it, it, it's fraught with difficulty. But that is true. I mean, we, yeah. I guess we're a little lucky in the sense, but to be very honest with you, the privacy has, has, has been solved. I mean, we target households where women live that use a specific type of birth control pills, and we target them with a competing brand, and then we can go back to the advertiser and say she switched or stayed. I mean, that would be unheard of in, in, in most of the world, but yet we do it all the time. We target households based on conditions, illnesses, prescribed drugs. Nobody even knows they're getting that, they're, they're, they're getting that ad. And, and it seems really weird and eerie when you actually talk about it, but it happens every day. I mean, the pharmaceutical category is probably 25% of my entire business just on segments like that. And Brian, what, what do you see in terms of how your clients are dealing with you know, the digital targeting and measurement universe as well as what's happening now on the addressable side in terms of commingling those? Uh, so addressables, I mean, first off, TV's always been measured, right? It was broad measurements, but it's always been measured. So I think TV actually brings that perspective of something other than super micro targeting. And, and when you get to a household level, um, get to digital out of home, you get to these different spectrums. It's about basically taking and having that data and using it against what are the goals for the advertiser. So addressable and digital are a signal that can provide that information across a household. So you know that in that neighborhood, these certain things happen. If you're a telco, you know certain traffic patterns. You know when people go to certain places, when they access the... There's a lot of information that can be gleaned from behavior and activity that the digital world's pretty comfortable with. And, you know, there's different players and intermediaries. But because you have more vertically integrated um, data sources, even if they aren't actually integrated, <laughs> but the data is all there, you can bring it together. And I think in a way that well, varying degrees of granularity, but that's still privacy compliant in every market to provide guidance as to what's useful. It doesn't have to be this person. It has to be these people show this tendency. All you're trying to do in most advertising is if you can move into 1%, that's a huge difference in market share. So it doesn't have to be to that person. It has to be, in, on average, are you going to see movement in this market for these people based on this behavior? And if you take the mindset of, of something that's more like TV and less like the digital approach where you're able to, to take that data and apply it and look at the results in aggregate rather than fixating on this device, this household, this cross-screen interaction. Like We all get fixated by the pretty shiny new toys on the screen, but there is a business for, you know, and I think performance TV is probably the best example where people are buying spots and they're kind of doing all of these funky things, but it works really well. You start adding in the data from mobile, you start adding in the table from watching behavior. You actually have something that's very powerful that doesn't freak people out, hopefully, and that you can measure. So it, it's a question of bringing that all together and, and maintaining the relationship that I think most kind of larger traditional media agencies or, or supply side have with their with their advertisers, right? It's not this disconnected thing that you have in digital. In digital, you kind of have a lot of people making uh, decisions based on their unique understanding. You can collapse that because it's a much tighter ecosystem. So I, I think that digital provides a lot of expectations for the advertisers, but some of the best practices coming from TV behavior can be blended together and make that a lot more efficient. So I, I, that's where we kind of look at where is it going, not just how do you duplicate what you do now, what are you, how do you make TV look digital, it's how do you actually achieve the end goal of the advertiser and understand how your media performs against that goal. That's the thing. I, I think the question I have about measurements and about attribution in general, um, you know, between TV and digital, is you know how do you <clears throat> how do you harmonize those those metrics, right? We we know that there's you know there is a, a plethora of metrics on, on the digital side. We also know that TV is uh, you know is measured quite simply. I mean, it's audience indexing, but as TV moves to addressable, right? How do you define viewability? I think you don't that care. It, 
You, but you don't care in the end. All you care is, does it move the needle that you want? Because if you fixate on that individual TV set, were they in front of it, who cares, right? You wanna know how did that campaign move the needle? So if you hyper-focus a, a campaign to 10 people, well, maybe it's gonna work, maybe it doesn't. But if you make it a broad enough segment, then does it move the needle for the advertiser? And the needle isn't a click or a conversion or these kind of proxies that don't really mean anything, mm -hmm. right? Does, do people buy it? Do they go visit their do website? But there has to be a balance. Do the attribution models but attribution, attribution tells you what happened. It doesn't tell you what's going to happen. But there has to be a balance between, I agree with you, 10 people, who cares? But just saying, I put an ad on TV and I sold toothpaste, no, 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 that's, that's crap too. There has right. to be something no, 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 That's between. where you have to start understanding, where did I place this? Where did it run against? What are the characteristics of this media? What did I do in the digital world? What did I do in the out-of-home world? What did I do on radio? You have to start understanding all of these things to see what's going on because, you know, if, if you look at the whole conversion or uh, retargeting business, right? Most of it's just as lazy as, as broad TV buys because those people are still gonna buy this stuff, right? If, you're, if I go to Amazon and I go look at you know, toothpaste, right? Maybe I'm gonna buy toothpaste, maybe I'm not, but it's a waste of money to go spend a lot of hyper-focused, high CPM ads showing me that toothpaste ad. That doesn't make a difference to me 99% of the time, and that's where the money goes. So it's, it's not that there's not waste in digital. <laughs> it's just no one bothers to, to measure it. I'm a bit biased on measurement, but I, either we bring all the census data and we need to collaborate as you know, all the data owners to bring all this data together to be measured. Um, that would be the ideal scenario. But in, in the existence of still the, the barbs and the SIM and the SKOs of the world, there need to be an adjustment because you don't want to be in a situation where an advertiser wouldn't want to put addressable because they would be scared of having an underlying campaign being not measured because the addressable message is not measured. So we need to, as, a, as an ecosystem, to work together in making that adjustment right. Ten minutes we can go? Okay. Uh, so let me ask a question. Mike, I have a question. Do you think in a couple, in the near future, that like you as an agency or advertiser will be able to do like deterministic reach and frequency like between Facebook, Google, and TV, or is it not gonna happen? No, I, I definitely do. Like that's, that's the biggest problem in advertising worldwide. We put ads on TV, we put ads on the internet, we have the slightest idea what the overlap and the reach and frequency duplication is. If we can solve that problem, that's more beneficial than any dynamically inserted ad ever. What we do now, at least in the US, and I understand we are not in the US, but our addressable campaigns have three components. We, if we want women with two children that purchase soup, we find the television households via addressable technology. We find the mobile devices that have that same segment. And we find the televisions that are connected to the internet via a device. And it all gets measured together via Experian, via a tag. So we do have unduplicated reach and frequency for the addressable campaigns. The problem is addressability is 1% right. or less of the entire television market. So if we can take that same approach and that practice that we have learned and benefit from, from this tiny little addressable piece and apply that to overall media, that will be far more important. And we're getting there. We, we, we're getting there. It's just that's, that's the slow boat to wherever the hell you're going. <laughs> Yeah. Before going into the Facebook and the Google, I would argue that there's still a point of trying to bring the cross-screen measurement between mm -hmm. the linear and the on-demand within the same environment, let alone Facebook and Google. But, you know, like a, a broadcaster would want to know how the linear performs and how, how that links to their on-demand so they can, you know, they can cap and retarget um, accordingly. And um, the data will bring that. So I don't think it's in a, a very far future where uh, we'll be able to merge um, linear data with on-demand data, uh, at least within, a, within the telco environment where potentially we have access to both. And doing but we need to do it together. Yeah, and, and achieving that is far more powerful than a dynamically inserted ad. Right, right. Uh, Javier, how, as a platform provider, you know, I'll tell you, we, uh, Stu mentioned this earlier, we, we spend a ton of time on uh, integration work with, with various providers, right? Because there's kind of a whole bunch of different platform providers that work with the pay TV providers across the board globally. And, and how do you guys, as, as a large platform provider for the pay TV providers, how do you guys view advertising kind of as a future business for you guys and enabling that for your clients? Thanks for the scurry ball, appreciate <laughs> it. Uh, no, I think, uh, 
I think, I mean, I, uh, I go back to, to Stuart's point earlier about the diversity of technologies, of set top boxes, of different uh, generations in the, uh, in, the, in the video landscape. And I think that, you know, uh, that there are solutions out there. Uh, they all have, you know, different degrees of robustness, scalability, et cetera. And, and I think that, um, you know, what's happening uh, with the increased, you know, competitive field in the, uh, in video delivery, the OTT providers and all, is, is good in a sense that it's, it's spurring investment and we're seeing that. Um, and so, you know, all this, uh, all this deployed base will be a lot more powerful uh, to be able to, you know, uh, deploy addressability a lot more easily. Uh, so we, we see that, you know, uh, we, we see that, that supply and that, that, uh, that, that addressability uh, reaching, you know, 90 to 100 uh, percent at some point, uh, and then at that point, right, it will be will be a matter of uh, growing the, the business model, right? Cool. So we have a few minutes left. Uh, I think how we'll close it out is I'll ask each one of you just kind of one cool, innovative thing that you're looking to do in 17 in, in terms of the near term uh, related to this. We've covered a lot of ground. I'll start with you, Stu. I mean, I'm, we're working really hard now to get data sets, and we, we've got an awful lot of data at Bell, mobility and, and everything else, and we're trying to get those data sets into our inventory to allow data-enabled television. And I, I just think it's really exciting. You've got a very powerful medium that you can add more data to, which makes it even more powerful, which is fantastic. And if I can use that across my other platforms too, I'm all good. Yep. Brian? Um, one of the things we're working on is basically trying to minimize or eliminate the need to integrate separately with every data provider and every supply source. So how do you do that in a consistent way that allows everybody to bring their data to the table, doesn't let them give it up? Because if you have TVs and things like that that don't move, once that data's out, the data's out. So how do you, how do you make the data available? How do you protect the assets of each of the holders? Because the, the subscriber information, the advertiser information, third parties like Experian or someone like that, how do you bring that together that everybody can kind of have confidence moving forward that their data can be applied um, at scale and that you don't have to integrate with every single party over and over again. So. I simply, in 17, I want to do exactly what Stuart and Laurent said over the course of the past 20 minutes, and that's figure out the balance between a dynamically inserted ad, a data-infused media campaign, and optimizing it in as close to real time as we can get. Because if you do those things, you will reduce waste, you will improve targeting, and the methodology really doesn't matter because the advertiser will actually get what they want for less, and the media owner will actually make more money via less inventory. Everybody wins. Um, we've been building the capabilities both on the data side and on technology side for the last couple of years. Uh, really for us the innovation will be to go to market because as much as we like to talk about addressability, it's very, very nascent in Europe. Um, we don't have the two minutes to, to start playing with. So bringing all the players, you know, the broadcasters, the buyers and the data owners on that journey for us is, is the challenge for 2017. And for us, I think it's, it's really trying to to drive the, the technologies that will enable those, you know, uh, dynamic addressable models to be uh, more pervasive throughout the markets, right? We, we haven't talked a lot about uh, what, what providers are doing also in terms of reaching out to multiple devices. These are, you know, a force that are developing right now. Uh, I'd like to see this grow fast and quickly. Great. Thanks, everyone.